I'm missing one panelist, but uh, we're going to get started uh, anyway. So uh, my name is uh, Peter Young, I'm the class of 74 Brantford, and I want to welcome you to the 29th uh, uh, Yale Career Panel, and this one is on a candid view of investment banking. Uh, this started about seven years ago when a group of us felt that uh, that uh, students and alumni really didn't have uh, access to people who could really give them uh, a sort of a candid and, 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 and balanced view of what it was like to be in various professions. Uh, and so uh, a group of us uh, alumni uh, decided to put these together. And uh, this, again, is uh, 29th in the series, and we've covered a very wide variety of professions. Uh, but uh, the um, idea in particular is to focus on careers that have a lot of mythology. Uh, for example, you know, the TV shows about lawyers and, and doctors glamorize uh, the profession. And uh, so uh, they seem very exciting, but there's some negative aspects that you just don't see on, on TV. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, just uh, tell you that uh, in this case, we have a number of people here who are uh, in person here uh, uh, in, in, in this office. Uh, and then there are a number of you who are participating via streaming video. So I wanna welcome all of you. Uh, and uh, you will be able to ask questions at the end. Uh, the, the is a chat function at a minimum. Uh, and there's also a Q&A function where you're uh, able to uh, pose questions. So uh, with that, uh, I also want to introduce uh, our panelists here. Uh, Kelly Chang is a managing director at Barclays Debt Capital Markets Group, uh, where she advises real estate and industrial clients on debt and interest rate products, but also uh, uh, on capital structure optimization. Uh, so she, they, she's involved with global bond offerings, loans and risk management, uh, often in the context of some a client doing an acquisition or refinancing or restructuring. Uh, she also had previous experience in M&A uh, earlier in her career, uh, and she uh, uh, graduated from Yale in Economics and East Asian Studies and has an MBA from Harvard Business School. Uh, hopefully our second panelist, uh, Shariar Azi will uh, be joining us uh, right now with the RAIN and also the uh, UN uh, uh, General Assembly. Uh, it's creating a lot of havoc in terms of people getting around. But he's a managing director uh, at UBS. Um, I'm actually the third panelist. Usually I'm just the moderator, uh, but I uh, uh, run an investment banking uh, boutique and uh, but in my previous career before starting this firm, uh, Young and Partners, uh, 22 years ago, was I was running the chemical industry group at Lehman, uh, similarly uh, chemical investment banking at Schroeder's as a partner, and also uh, ahead of the chemical M&A group at Solomon Brothers. So I have the, shall we say, privilege of, uh, of having been both at large investment banks, uh, but also at a boutique. So with that, uh, let's get started. What I'd, I'd like to do though, is just to say that we're going to go through about five or six questions. Uh, and uh, 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 and uh, basically I'll be posing questions that uh, Kelly will answer, but also I guess I will answer as, uh, as one of the uh, co-panelists. Um, stepping back, um, if you think about investment banking as an industry, mm -hmm. I mean, you're fortunate that you have been in it for a while. Right. Uh, uh, and so you've seen some of the changes that have been occurring uh, uh, over the years. Mm -hmm. And of course, we went through the financial crisis in 2008 right. and 9, which really changed a lot about how the investments operate. So if you were to take a big picture uh, uh, view mm -hmm. and say, you know, what do you think is happening in investment banking? How is it changing and what it, will it look like, you know, going out uh, five, 10 years? You know, what, how would you characterize that? Right. So um, uh, thank you, Peter, for having me on this panel. I would say that um, I've spent all of my career on the, uh, the IB side, so on the private side, and that I think pretty consistently has just become more and more of a global business. Um, and I think that's definitely something that has really 
been what's been driving a lot of whether it's the m a transactions that we're seeing or a lot of the capital markets transactions and part of that is just as companies are looking to get more growth they're looking to um, to acquire companies not just in their own geographies but also around the world um, and i think also uh, just even things like tax factors that's something that has driven a lot of companies to redomicile outside of the us and in other jurisdictions and so we're definitely seeing that this business, which when I joined almost 20 years ago, was very proud of being a very global business, is even more so now. So you've got a lot of uh, non-US companies who come to the US to do capital raising, a lot of US companies going abroad uh, to, to raise money, particularly through the debt markets. And then alongside that, it's just with a lot of the risk management products, whether it's interest rate derivatives or managing their foreign currency exposure, um, even with things like a unified European currency, um, it, it means that as a U.S. company, if you do a lot of business in Europe, you have a much larger currency exposure. And, uh, and so companies have to be very smart about a lot of uh, not just strategic issues, but also a lot of the financial products and instruments that are available to them. You know, investment banks actually, I guess if you look at history, uh, investment banks started sort of the mid 1800s, mm -hmm. uh, first in trading and then eventually into a lot of other products. Um, and they were small partnerships, mm -hmm. really. And in fact, uh, for I guess the first hundred years or so, uh, firms like JP Morgan and so forth are relatively small partnerships. Mm -hmm. And sort of, the size issue really escalated in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, mm -hmm. and also the number of different products of what, you know, you know, do you see that uh, continuing or do you, you know, getting larger and larger? Or do you think that, you know, and I know there's been a lot of publicity about boutiques they're formed mm -hmm. and so forth, but I suspect it depends upon what area of the business you're in, whether it's going right. to go this way or that way, right? Right. So definitely something I remember when I was in college, the universal banking model was one that was developing and, and has continued to develop. And I think it's really just uh, to smooth out revenues uh, given some of the volatility associated with the trading side. But that just given a lot of the regulations that have been put in place since the financial crisis, by definition should be mitigated. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, a lot of banks like having asset management businesses and cards businesses because it's a very stable source of revenue to, to balance out some of the volatility associated with being a securities trading firm. So with some of these new regulations, you know, I think the original reason why banks diversified into some of those other products might be diminished, but frankly, they're good they're good stable sources of revenue, which when you're dealing with any type of volatile businesses um, is, is a good base to have for a company. So I, in terms of getting larger, I'm not, I, you know, I don't really see many more banks consolidating, but I do think that um, in terms of the, the depth and the breadth of products, I think that the banks that have been able to maintain those have found that that those have been beneficial to to just keeping earnings and I think uh, stable and I think as a lot of these institutions have gone from being privately held partnerships to being publicly traded companies that have quarterly earnings and want to smooth out the volatility um, some of the more diversified business models are are very helpful well there's also a dark side and 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 to be honest having been at Lehman and Solomon and so forth you know, one of the negatives of the diversified is you end up with a lot of conflicts of interest. And uh, I know when I was Lehman for mm -hmm. many, many times, we have run into some problem because some other part of Lehman mm -hmm. had done something that then created a problem for me on the investment banking side. I also think, though, it really depends upon what part of the business you're talking about. Because mm -hmm. there's some that are really capital intensive. Right. You, re you require big sales forces and, and, and trading and so forth. And their scale is critical and you not, not a lot of capital. There are others like M&A where you know, really don't need any capital and you don't need right. uh, sales force and so forth. So I think what, we've, what, I, what I think we've all noticed is that there have been a lot of boutiques that have started, mm -hmm. but they generally start in the areas where there's an economic reason why a boutique can do well mm -hmm. or there's a reason why they, they wouldn't fail, right? Right. Uh, you know? 
so, so, so that's really changed. And in fact, I think the market share of boutiques in areas like M&A, mm -hmm. actually they, they have about a third of the market, mm -hmm. which is upsetting to the large firms. But the reality is uh, for deals, uh, the key are the deal makers and who's working on it. It's not how many people, you don't need a hundred people to, to right. execute them and any transaction. Um, let's talk a little bit about, Apologize for being late. oh, well, we do have our third panelist. Uh, all right. So, Apologize. uh, we are just, uh, we've just gone through, uh, we're going through this profession, you know, where's it headed, good and bad. Um, so maybe you can offer a comment about, you know, as you look at the profession currently, uh, looking for what are the good things and bad things that you think are, are happening? Um, if we're speaking specifically about the investment banking landscape, uh, we have, obviously it's investment banking as we traditionally know it, which is uh, folks coming out of um, college, going into the analyst program at uh, any one of a uh, number of leading investment banks. And that aspect of the business as well, it's thriving. It continues to be a daunting and, and, and sometimes terrifying experience because of the amount of hours that people have to expend uh, being an analyst, whether it's a firm A, B, or C, it sort of doesn't matter. I think the, the part of the business that people tend not to focus on as much is uh, the wealth management side of investment banking. Most of the investment banks, Bank of America, UBS, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, et cetera, uh, they have wonderful training programs on the wealth management side and that business continues to grow. And I think from a lifestyle standpoint, Peter, I think it's probably something worth thinking about in addition to regular way investment banking. Now I'm going to be a bit of a contrarian with you and that is uh, because I've been at three large investment banks and I've been running a boutique. And first of all, for those of you in the audience, uh, there are a couple of ways you can work for an investment bank. Mm -hmm. The traditional way, if you're coming out of an undergraduate program is you join an analyst program, which used to be generally a two year program. And then, some of the people stayed on and some people went back to business school or changed professions. Uh, there, the other route is there are people who come in from some graduate school, maybe an MBA program, mm -hmm. and they come in as an associate and then ho hopefully uh, continue to do well and stay at the firm. Uh, the one thing that is true that you said is that the analysts and junior people work horrendous hours. Uh, what I disagree with you is that it's necessary uh, because I think part of it is that the, it's sort of like uh, hospitals for residents, right? There's no particular reason why a resident should work 72 hours in a row or 48 right. hours. In fact, you, you ask yourself, well, why? In fact, it's actually bad for the patient, right? And it's also true that it's not particularly true that uh, uh, analysts should work uh, until two, uh, one or two in the morning. And in fact, uh, having been there and now having been here, all our analysts go home at six. They don't work on weekends and we work on a lot of different projects. So a lot of it is how people choose to manage. Mm -hmm. The negative part, of course, is uh, as many of you know, uh, many analysts, they don't stay the two years. They leave right. after a year and so forth and they go to private equity or they go to other uh, uh, parts. And it is true that you know things like uh, uh, wealth management, which in, done in large firms and in, 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 in smaller firms have a very different lifestyle. But I think one of the things you have to ask yourself, and this is really a comment to those of you who are the audience is, uh, uh, what, you know, what you, why you want to be in investment banking mm -hmm. and are you willing to accept what goes with that lifestyle? Right. Right. But I wouldn't assume that it's a given that the typical quote, equivalent of uh, being a hospital resident is necessarily required everywhere, right? Uh, but also some things like private equity, very different lifestyle, right? Even though fundamentally what an analyst does at, at, a, at a Blackstone is not necessarily that different mm -hmm. from an investment bank. Let's talk a little bit about um, uh, myths versus realities. And I think all professions, you know, we've, right. we've had some wonderful things about architecture, about drama and film about, uh, you know, consulting. 
their myths and reality. So what would you list as some of the things you think so are, are myths uh, versus realities, good and bad, right? You know, right. Uh, there, there's some that are on both sides, right? Well, just picking up on the thread we were previously talking about, about lifestyle, I think that's definitely something that is a much greater area of emphasis and concern for the 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 younger generation than um, than say people when I was graduating from college and I think what people need to realize is your first job out of school whether you choose a career like investment banking professional services banking consulting or anything it's hard work because it's such a big culture shock from what you're used to from being a student and you need to learn a new craft, you make a lot of mistakes. So I think things um, that what you hear about when they say about investment banking, you just have to love working hundreds and hundreds of hours. I mean, I think you you don't necessarily have to work those types of hours um, and there are lots of different pockets, even you know whether it's wealth management or, or more of a capital markets facing role, but it is a tough slog when you first join because it is very much in my experience has been a lot like, um, like you're an apprenticeship model where you really need to learn a craft and learn a trade. And, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, think of banking as a two year or maybe even shorter program and go. And, um, and one of the things, about banking is that it does open a lot of doors for people. And so you do have the opportunity to go to any type of industry afterwards, whether it's going deeper into financial services or you know changing careers entirely and going working for a corporation or a startup. Um, but, and then sometimes you hear young people say, well, I've learned everything I've needed to learn. And I just think, well, that's definitely a myth because in three years, it's very difficult to learn any part of a craft or a trade. And I would say that one of um, the, I was an analyst before I went to business school and a lot of people were, and most people after graduating from business school chose different professions. And I actually think that the, one of the, 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 greatest things that I found about the career is that it's become more and more interesting each year that I work there because you're, your roles and your responsibilities change over time, but it's because it is like an apprenticeship, it's a very gradual change. So when you arrive at the next level, you're fully equipped to do so. So I would say a myth is like, you're just swimming with the sharks and you're on your own. I think banking has um, a very strong mentorship culture. And I say it's definitely something that, um, that, that gets better the longer you stay at it and, uh, and the better that you understand your craft and ultimately the clients that are behind the work that we do. I would say, mention a couple of uh, uh, myths. First of all, I think just to say invest in banking, a little bit like what uh, he mentioned, is a misnomer because there's so many different parts of investing mm -hmm. that can be dramatically different in terms of what you work on, the skills and so forth. Just like to say, I work for a corporation. Well, if you're in manufacturing or R&D or marketing or finance, it can be a very, very different experience. You can learn a lot of different, very different things. So one thing I would encourage all of you on is to talk to people who are in the industry in the different areas. Because it may be that you know, you're know you not a good fit in mm -hmm. M&A, but you might be a terrific fit in the equity research, right, for example, or in, uh, you know, wealth, wealth management and so forth. So don't think of it as just one big profession. It's actually, there's some parts that are as different from each other mm -hmm. as, you know, you know, being an entrepreneur versus, you know, being, being in a large company. Uh, the other is don't accept that uh, the natural thing is two years and you go to business school. The reality is oh, there are many people I know who uh, who started as analyst, rose all the way up to the managing director. One of our senior people here was head of chemicals at Morgan Stanley. He never went to business school. He started mm -hmm. as an analyst and went all the way up and became not only managing director, but, uh, but head of chemicals for Morgan Stanley. So I wouldn't have just assume that that's the case. In fact, you know, there are many, many examples of people who just joined and stayed for mm -hmm. a long time. I think the other thing to remember as you go through just within the confines of investment banking is the culture of the organization that you are joining. Um, without naming names, there are, those, there are certain firms that are 
known for having a very demanding culture. Um, and, and the culture, I mean, it's, it, it sounds like a terrific thing to talk about, hey, it's all about the people, it's all about the culture. In fact, it is. Um, I can name names of firms that because of the culture, because of the heritage, and because of the leadership of the organization, the, uh, the culture is one of 24 seven. And if you are not in the flow with that culture, with the, with sort of with the program, you're going to be left behind. And any one of you who's, you know, obviously are great achievers, you don't want to be left behind. So you want to make sure that you are in an organization which is relatively speaking conducive to the way you think um, you want to conduct your professional life. And, um, now, of course, a lot of institutions, a lot of banks have come up with this, hey, Saturdays, nobody can reach you on the telephone. Theoretically. You gotta, yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can turn off your cell phones, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's a myth. Yeah. Because the reality is if your managing director, your VP, your director wants to get a hold of you, and you are hiding behind this, oh, I can't turn on my cell phone because that's what the policy of the XYZ firm is. I mean, you are going to be left behind and nobody's going to write you an email saying you've been a bad boy or girl, but that is going to affect your life. So I think people going into investment banking, though it's still got a lot of razzle dazzle, it's got a lot of attractive features, you get paid well, um, but people need to get into this with their eyes wide open because out there, there's a lot of interesting things people can do. And none of us in this room are trying to advocate that investment banking is the right answer. It's got to be the right answer for you. Fortunately, you are at an institution where you can get a lot of intelligence, both in terms of the, the overall scope, the limitation the magnitude of the task ahead in investment banking and you can explore the cultural differences between various organizations that you may be talking to. Yeah. And I would, I would, I would, uh, uh emphasize what uh, Sherry said. did. And part of it also, I would say, I usually start out uh, these sessions with the following comment, but I'll make it now is the one thing that the three of us cannot answer is, uh, is is your ability to know yourself and everyone is different and I think self-assessment and getting some friends who are willing to be honest about what are you good at what are you not good at what kind of personality you have and so forth is so critical because uh, uh, each person may be different in terms of whether they will fit a particular mm -hmm. profession or a particular firm but the other is really what he said is there's some really different personalities among firms and you may be a beautiful fit with one firm and a horrible fit with another. I had the privilege of working for three ma major firms uh, uh, in, in my career, Samba, Brothers, Schroeders, and Lehman. Three radically different personalities. I mean, at Solomon Brothers, it was a trading mentality. If, if someone didn't like you, they never hit it, they would start screaming at you and yelling at you from about 50 feet away, right? totally transparent, but if you were one of these genteel types, it was a horrible experience. At Schroeder's, it was quite the opposite. Everyone was very polite. They were long memos. It was like sort of the British colony kind of approach. And then Lehman was somewhere in between. So very, very different personalities. So so there are really two things. One is uh, you you have to know yourself and, and know what, what kind of profession, what kind of firm is a fit with you. But the other is you have to do your homework about individual firms because even within any individual profession, there's some really different personalities, right? Right. The, the personalities are important. Your own fit within the personality and the culture of the firm is important. But I think recognize that regardless of the nuances of, of the personalities with, that differentiate various firms, it is going to be at any one of these large organizations, and I'm, I'm gonna make the distinction between a large firm and a boutique, but at any one of these large firms, 
because it's not just kids from Yale, but they are kids from all over the place because you know they throw extremely wide net in terms of who they hire and what the firms that they, the, and, sorry, the uh, schools that they hire from, you will find people in your peer group who are going to be working 24 seven. So there's also a culture of how do you fit in and you've got to really understand that going in in terms of not just what the overall culture is, but also understanding, you know, what does your peer group look like? And it's not, you know, it's not the genteel thing. You know, you got people from all over the place and some of them are, you know, may potentially be hungrier than you. So again, it comes to what is your mindset? How is it that it, you fit in with the culture? And what does your peer group potentially look like? I'm going to turn to the next question. So, mm -hmm. Kelly, uh, you've you know uh, uh, you've been in banking uh, for a while, and you've probably you've seen a lot of people who've done well. You've seen mm -hmm. people who were happy. You've seen people who haven't done well. You probably ha also had people who've done well that are unhappy, right? right? So, if you think about it, is there any pattern that you see in terms of the people who? Uh, either, you know, one did well in the areas that you're mm -hmm. in uh, or were happy or the, and the people who weren't happy and the people who ended up deciding to leave. Is there any pattern or maybe no pattern? I don't know. Well, I think um, mentorship is really important. And I think that, and not necessarily the formal mentorship programs, but along the arc of your career. And um, there are going to be people along the way, whether it's your a junior analyst and you know helping you find your way through the weeds and making yourself realize okay I can handle this for another couple of years or just as you get more senior and the stakes become um, higher you know getting promoted to you know across the the firm but I think that that's something that that is very important especially at these larger organizations because it's you know, it's, it's, it's hard to find your way sometimes. And, and, you know, it's just, um, it's helpful to have the wisdom of, of people who've gone before you. So it's not to say that a mentor needs to be someone who's super, super senior in the organization, but even someone who's just like, you know, when you're a sophomore, knowing someone who, who is a junior, just someone who can just help you find your way through the weeds. And, and it doesn't matter whether you're an analyst trying to make it from your first six months of your career to the first year of your career or trying to make managing director. I mean, the grass is always tall in, in the, the, the place where you're standing and it's helpful to have someone. So, um, so you know, I think, and how do you cultivate good mentors? I think having a good attitude. I mean, people tend to like people who are are interested in, in their profession. Um, and I think it's hard to, to keep faking it forever. So, um, and sometimes, you know, it's like, even at this point, I don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life. But, but I think the blessing that we have from having gone to Yale is everyone has broad and diverse interests and, and and a lot of things that we do we do find very interesting um, and that's a way that you can engage other people on your team and banking is it's a very team-based culture you know people work a lot together so you have a lot of opportunities to work with different types of people and and I would say with things like culture it's hard to say an entire firm has a culture because they're definitely just it might even be just one team within the group that you just happen to click really well with and and it's and it's a group of people that you stay with throughout your career yeah. any comment no I think I think that's very fair um, but but I think while different groups or different sets of groups would have different cultures, and I say that with a lowercase c, in terms of how they operate, uh, the overall reputation of some of these firms is something that you do need to focus on because it permeates through the organization. And one can be, one group may be a little bit more generous in terms of how they treat their associates and analysts but it there is an overarching culture that one needs to be aware of the other thing that is worth focusing on is again i'm i'm, I'm repeating myself is this the right thing for you you know your roommate johnny may be the right fit to go into investment bank or you or jane may be the right person to go into investment bank because they have you know have 
they pretty much set in their minds that at age 27, they want to go to business school and then they want to be in private equity. That may or may not necessarily be what, uh, what you want to do. So keep your eyes open. I think the, level, the kinds of opportunities that are now available to folks coming out of college uh, and I'm not trying to steer people away from investment banking, but some of the opportunities that are out there, whether it's with startups or with you know other parts of finance and in the corporate world, are much more extensive and ex and expansive than certainly when Peter and I were coming out of college. Yeah. On the other hand, I also want I actually am agreeing uh, with what he said in the sense that. Don't do just what your best friend or, or, or someone does because you, you may be very different. The other the comment I would make is beware of fads. And, you know, whether when I came out of undergraduate, when I came out of business school, the one thing that's clear in, in, in reflecting back mm -hmm. uh, was that there were just all these fads. And unfortunately, a large percentage of the students were susceptible. to. It. So one is the one you mentioned, which is startups. I mean, the number of Yale students who are going to startups is, it's, it's a big number. And I, I track the numbers so we figure out which panels to do. We track the right. numbers of what's where the graduates are. I'm glad we're still on the list of industries to no, have a but, panel. But, you know, it, it is true that there are opportunities in startups. And there's some mm -hmm. interesting aspects of being in startups that you are just very different and, and appealing. It's also true that, um, that, a lot of students are going into startups with a really bad understanding of what the odds of success yeah. are and, uh, and, and, and the trade-offs, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, quote, a fad. So I would say make sure that you uh, ask yourself uh, the ones that everyone says, well, this is what is exciting to do, that you really take a look and see whether that's really true or not. But the other is you might want to look at the ones that are out of fashion, right? Mm -hmm. Now, some are out of fashion for a good reason, and they're really the professions in turmoil, right? right. But others get out, they go in and out of fashion. So I'm not saying that you should go and invest in banking because it's not, quote, in fashion. But, but for sure, you shouldn't uh, discard it because people say it's not fashionable, right? In the same way that you shouldn't go into startups and a couple of other things uh, uh, because... Uh, everyone thinks it's fashionable, mm -hmm. right? It, 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 there's a lot about it that isn't, you know, isn't isn't necessarily positive. So the next thing is, I think uh, uh, if you uh, uh, thought about uh, what's happened to people now, the three of us mm -hmm. went to investment banking early, right? Have, it was your entire career investment banking? Yeah. Okay, so you went to the dark side early, right? Yeah. <laughs> And you, you've been investing banking. Right. Mine's different in that I started out in strategy consulting at Bain and Company, uh, and then went into private equity, and then went to investment banking laterally. So there's a little bit different, but all of us have been investing for a while. Right. So what do you do though, if you leave investment banking? What are the options? It, you know, I think not everyone you know retires to the gold watch and plays mm -hmm. golf or whatever it may be. So what are the kinds of things that people do that? Not us, because we haven't retired right. yet. Uh, that people do that, you know, that are logical things that you can do once you're in investment banking. Well, I think that's why investment banking continues to be a really popular industry for people to start in, because it is a very, very good training ground, and it's a rubber stamp. Because for better or worse, people think about, wow, this person is very tenacious, can is very dedicated, is a really hard worker and can work well under pressure. And that's applicable and attractive to employers of, of any discipline. Um, I think with careers, you know, companies are shaped like pyramids. So the younger you are in your career, then you have more flexibility in terms of of moving around and, and making pretty significant pivot. So a lot of people who have left the banking program um, at Barclays, they, you know, you might have worked in the consumer retail group, but you end up working for a media company afterwards, or, you know, you go to some sort of fintech type startup. So 
so there's a lot of um, acceptance and uh, willingness from new employers to take the base that you have established in banking and basically the fact that you've proven yourself and you've cut your teeth through an analyst program and, and mold you into whatever the new organization uh, needs. As people get more senior in their career, a lot of what I think makes people think about careers more cautiously is not wanting to quote unquote take a step back because once you've invested a lot of time in honing your craft, you understand how the organization works. Um, you know, it can be very daunting to think about, well, you know, do I really want to just start from scratch all over again and and improve myself? But um, so what we typically see in when people leave um, the uh, financial services industry is a lot of people they go to an adjacent industry so Did they um, go to clients right? a lot of people go Hired to clients, clients as well right? so because in the end we are a client facing organization and as a as a banker your goal is to be a company's trusted advisor and oftentimes your client trusts you so much that that they want to hire you so that you can be part of their team permanently yeah i think um in terms of potential exits, you've touched on all the all the areas where uh, folks can go. Uh, I've seen people leave the industry completely. So, uh, depending on you know your economic well-being, at any one point in time, you could go off and uh, do something completely esoteric. You know, work with a uh, uh, not-for-profit organization. I've seen a number of senior bankers go into that, um, into that uh, sort of not-for-profit uh, sector. Um, clients certainly mm -hmm. end up end up end up potentially hiring you. Uh, you can go into other adjacent industries. Uh, I know people who've now go gone on to become from banking, have gone on to become CEOs of media companies uh, because that was the industry that they were focused on while in investment banking. So there are plenty of opportunities. Obviously, the one, Peter, you mentioned right at the outset, depending on uh, the time that you spent in banking is, uh, is private equity. Uh, that tends to be one, uh, one industry that draws people from banking at different stages of your your career is it after two years in uh, as an analyst? Is it three years after being an associate coming out of business school? Is it ten years out of out of uh, you know covering a different sector, going into private equity? So private equity debt does tend to uh, uh, draw from the investment banking pool with considerable amount of uh, with considerable frequency. But there's an example of a profession that maybe too many people have jumped to the swimming pool. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, the number, I have to tell you, I get a, two calls a day from private equity firms saying, do you have any deals for me? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the number of private equity firms that have, have, have cropped Probably up, you really, you really wonder, you know, it's sort of like hedge funds where mm -hmm. too many got into the pool. Uh, I, on that question about where people go, I'd like to give two examples, and they're real examples from younger partners. So, uh, first of all, we have very low turnover, you know, junior level people go to business school and so forth, but in terms of senior people, in the last year that a senior person left this firm was 2009, so that we don't have a whole lot of turnover. However, I'll tell you two story, real examples. We had one fellow who was a senior vice president here, and he was very good and uh, uh, on the chemical side, because we do chemicals and life science. We were working on a deal, uh, uh, and the client, which was a client of mine, uh, the CEO fired his CFO because there was some insurrection and then didn't have a CFO and hired my senior mm -hmm. vice president actually called and said, I'm going to demonstrate to you, Peter, that I'm not a good friend because I want to <laughs> hire, you know, one of your people. And so uh, this gentleman became a CFO of a public company which is a wonderful transition. Mm -hmm. The other example is I had a fellow who was an associate. He joined the firm. He was in the life science practice at another firm. He joined and he did something that no one thought was possible, which is he went from, he fell in love with chemicals. So he went from life sciences, chemicals, which as yeah. you know, no one ever does, right? Mm -hmm. uh, supposedly. But then uh, we were working on a, on, on a deal and one that we were selling business and one of the potential 
uh, buyers uh, was Honeywell. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just fell in love with <laughs> my guy who was the vice president. And they hired him to do M&A at, at Honeywell. Uh, we still have a very good relationship uh, with him. And today, he's running a business with $500 million of revenue, million of revenue at Honeywell. So there are two good examples of you know, wonderful transitions mm -hmm. that are possible uh, if you, you know, are, have the skills that you develop uh, in investment banking. You know? uh, I also know one fellow who was managing director at Lehman, and he currently is uh, writing children's uh, books. <laughs> Wow. So, so, <laughs> yeah. so, so the lots of different transitions, right. right? Yeah, there's life after investment banking is a short answer. And I think, um, but I, you know, go back to the initial point which we made, which was, it is excellent training. It is hard work. Culturally, it's a function of, you know, the organization you were in. But at the end of the day, it, one should go into it with a clear understanding that it's going to require a lot of hard work. Uh, the hours, generally speaking, are going to be pretty horrendous, certainly in the first couple of years. Um, I'll give you an example. My son is just came out of business school uh, a year ago, uh, is an associate at one of the name brand investment banks, and his hours are absolutely horrible. Now I can always say, hey, I did the same thing, but um, that's not an excuse. I mean, his, his hours are absolutely horrible and he's, you know, he's got friends' weddings that he'll miss, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you've got to put a lot into it. There are a lot of sacrifices, both personal and, and emotional, that you do have to go through. It, uh, generally speaking, again, to Peter's point, um, if you work for Peter, of course, you know, he lets you go home at five o'clock and six o'clock. Is it six? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, six uh, yeah. God bless you. Because, uh, and you don't call them on weekends. You know? No, no, no. Well, once in a while they have once to work. The week. But, you know, the reality is, and, and I, I, I have a very strong feeling about this because I work large firms and so forth. And uh, I think that the long hours which are true for maybe 95% of all the investment yeah. banks, right? Is more, not the nature of the business, uh, it is the management skills of investment bankers. No, it's in my, in my view, because I gotta tell you, I wouldn't hire an investment bank to run a lemonade stand because they'd screw up. They just don't know how to manage. And I, I'll tell you, I mean, we hired a, 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 a secondary analyst from uh, Lehman Brothers, and she had spent her entire two years just doing pitch book after pitch book after pitch book, horrible. Never went to see a client, worked mm -hmm. late hours, so forth. Just totally mismanaged. But she said, here's the problem. If we were doing a project looking at an LBO for a client, a private equity firm, the managing director here has to think about what are the two or three scenarios that really make sense, mm -hmm. and then tell the analyst, at, at my old firm, Lehman, you know, typically they would, the managing director would go and say, just do it do every possible combination and then I'll look at them and then they look at 50 combinations, throw 49 out. So a lot of it is a, a derelict Man. management on the part mm -hmm. of the senior person, but some of it is just the nature of being in a client business, right? Right. Where you can't control what a client wants and if they say at five o'clock, I need something by eight in the morning, you know, uh, uh, that's out of the control of any manager mm -hmm. style, right? So, but if you're going to most investment banks, what he's saying is absolutely correct, which is you have to accept what's going to happen in the first two or three years, because that's true for 98, 97% of investment banks, right? You know, uh, now um, I want to see whether that we have quite a few people on and I'm going to see if anyone has any questions. There are two ways you can ask a question. One is there is a and A function, which sometimes works and doesn't work. If you'll see it on your screen, the other is a chat function here which if you click on chat, you can pose a question and we can see it on our screen here and, uh, and, and one of us will answer. So let me see if anyone has any questions.
Anyone? We can't have answered every possible question. I know. <laughs> well, I will then uh, ask one question, which is, what was the alternative that each of you thought of, if you did, uh, uh, versus a mess bank before you chose a mess bank? Kelly? So I, um, when I was uh, in college and in business school, I actually did my internships at corporations, so doing corporate development. And um, those were both really great experiences, but I guess I maybe experienced a little bit of FOMO, which was why just park yourself in one corner of the world when you haven't really explored the rest of the world. And so what really attracted me to investment banking was the fact that you get to work with so many different companies and you really get a view into not just how one organization does things, but how this whole big swath of different companies um, do different things. And, and you, you really see that all of our clients, they all handle things a little differently. Some are more aligned with my style, some are a little less, but, um, but I, I really loved the exposure and then also so the pace as well. I mean, I'm someone who, um, you know, was just really interested in, in learning how to do things after Yale. I loved my Yale experience. I love the fact that you just learn how to learn, but I was really eager to, to be able to feel like I knew how to do something. And I felt like the pace of investment banking and the fact that you work on so many transactions at the same time was a, a fast way to, to get that, um, that knowledge expertise. And one thing's for sure is, I guarantee you, you will not be bored, right? Right, yes. You will not be bored because there's so much variety. The other is, some of the, the exposure to clients mm -hmm. is wonderful, and they're all different, right? I mean, you have clients who are in all different kinds of industries. Right. The other is, the, the opportunity to really cutting edge and creative uh, analytics is really wonderful. And that is very rewarding. I mean, mm -hmm. we've had to deal with really tough problems. How to, for example, how to predict what will happen to the stock price of a biotech company uh, if they have a successful phase three uh, clinical trials. Uh, we have analytical tools to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But you, it does require some really pretty significant uh, analytical skills. Okay, so we have a couple, we have three questions, that's good. So the first question is from Philip. He says, hi, that's good, very friendly. I have one quick question. When you said long hours, how long are we, how long are we talking about? Thanks. Would either one <laughs> answer the question? Go ahead. Yeah, you answered it, yeah. Okay, well, I mean, I think it depends on, so again, it's, it's very long in the beginning because you just frankly, don't know what you're doing and you you have you make a lot of mistakes and you have to correct them it does depend on what pockets of the firm you're in so i work in debt capital markets and that's more of more of market hours um, but you know i think people pretty regularly work probably like 12 hour days yeah. um, in a more capital markets function the the storied area of long hours is the M and A product, and and as Peter was saying, a lot of it is just the function of the deal life cycle. So, you know, once a public transaction is announced, you can always have another bidder jump in and bid a higher price. And guess what? Everyone involved, whether you're the banker, the the consultants, the lawyers, the accountants, everyone's working around the clock to try to figure out if you're representing the seller what's better a bird in hand or this new guy coming in offering more money and you're under a very tight timeline because these new bids can come in at any hour of the day. Whereas the capital markets, it's more regulated because your investors are only in certain hours of the day. And, and when you're not working on deals and you're thinking about new opportunities for your clients, so, it's, you know, so the marketing and the but if you're in trading, you know, when yeah. the trading is done, you're done. So right. the, the, there are these, you know, the people in the trading, in the trading part of the business, I mean, their hours are really very, very precise yes, and short. Yeah. So it can really, it can really vary. Uh, the next question, let's see, let's see here. Uh, okay, so here's a question from Riley uh, to any of the panelists. Can you speak to the experience of starting at a boutique versus a large investment bank out of college? Any comments? Um, <clears throat> 
I think I think today the boutiques are, are competing head to head with all of the large investment banks. So just to take an example, uh, whether it's Centerview or PJT or any one of these, uh, maybe your organization yes, also, absolutely. you're competing head to head with the Goldman Sachs of this world. So the fact that it is a boutique is sort of irrelevant because uh, the pay scale is pretty much consistent because this is a in a fairly incestuous industry. Everybody knows that an incoming associate or incoming analyst gets uh, is on the on on the following pay scale. It's pretty well advertised. Everybody knows there's a huge amount of transparency. So the fact that you have an offer from or you're exploring going to an Evercore versus JP Morgan. I don't think there's any difference in, in comp. In fact, I will tell you there is no comp. I mean, there's a maybe a delta of five thousand dollars one way or the other, or ten thousand dollars. But it's um, I know those are not insignificant numbers when you're coming out of college. But it's pretty much um, pretty much well understood what an incoming analyst would or associate would make. Um, and but you know, there's some real differences. Uh, I, I would say this. There are a lot of different segments. So it also depends on what you define mm -hmm. as a boutique, you know? Uh, and, you know, I think that uh, uh, if you compare the large firms, it uh, depends on where in the large firm you are, right? Whether you're in trading or private yeah. wealth manager, whatever, those are as big a differences as, as, as being in a boutique versus not. The other is, I think you have to look at the boutiques. I would say some of the boutiques are just smaller versions of the large firms. Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. And the guys who started them, the, the, all they knew how to do was the same style as when they were with Bear Stearns or whatever, and they create just a smaller version. So it really is not that different. You're just a smaller firm. On the other hand, there are a lot of boutiques who, are, who operate differently, like my firm. We just have a very different strategy, different structure, or they only operate in a particular segment, right? So if you have an M&A, just an M&A boutique, it's going to be a very different experience than if you're at a broader a boutique or a large firm. So I would say there are some very, very significant differences in lifestyle, what you do, and so forth. But the boutiques tend not tend to focus in a couple of product areas, right? Right. They tend not to have everything. Uh, and to be honest with you, those firms that say, okay, we're just going to grow and become mid-sized versions of the large firms, they tend to disappear because they're stuck in no man's land where they don't have the scale uh, to be competitive, but they have all the overhead costs, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why you'll see a lot of your firm, most of the firms that go on to the mid-size trying to be full service, they get, they, they get, they get trapped. Yeah, the, the important thing about the boutiques is some of them focus on uh, specific industries. So a lion tree is very much a TMT, um, telecom, media, uh, technology focused firm. They do an extraordinarily fine job and they, and they focus pretty much on the M&A product. One of the key differentiators between a, a boutique and a large investment bank is that they are typically capital light. -like. What does that mean? they are typically not putting their own capital to work in terms of underwriting debt alongside the advice that they give on an M&A trade. They're not in the, in the business of doing uh, underwriting an IPO where they are actually committing their capital base into the execution part of the business. So again, some of the boutique, right. Yeah, some of the boutiques will focus only on certain industries. Uh, Centerview, which is a terrific boutique run by Blair Efron and others, is used to be focused on the consumer retail sector, which is what Blair's expertise is. Now there are, they're focused on a whole host of sectors and an exceptionally uh, successful firm, uh, but they're capital light. They're not putting their own capital on the line if they are helping somebody buy a two, three, four, five billion dollar company. 
Now, the next question is from Catherine, who says, do you feel that career in investment banking allows you to learn new skills every step of the way? Let me start and say yes and no. I think that uh, uh, as you progress, I think basically investment banking, it's one that you have to continue to progress, mm -hmm. right? If you flatten out, then usually your career goes side for a while, but then it's hard to stay in. But I do think that you are learning different skills if you continue to grow and get and get promoted. But there are periods of time where uh, uh, it might flatten out, you know, where for two or three years, there are no additional technical skills you're necessarily learning. But you may be learning client skills or interpersonal mm -hmm. skills or other things that are quite different than technical skills. Right. So in my own experience, I feel that at least for the first uh, 10 or 15 years, I felt every year I was learning something different. Right? And then as you get older, of course, then you run out of you know, <laughs> sort of changes. Uh, but maybe the, the things you learn there have more to do with management skills, mm -hmm. uh, interpersonal skills, skills yeah. and client skills and so forth. Uh, you, any, you, do you have an answer to that question about uh, growing along? I agree. Along? I mean, I feel like, again, it's like, it's like an apprenticeship. I mean, it's just, especially the, as you're younger, the learning curve, it's definitely very steep. And, um, and then, you know, as, as you get more senior, then, but you're always fine tuning your, your, your skills. And, and in the end, when you become, you know, a managing director, then you're responsible for, the PNL and for growing and cultivating, expanding your client base. And then also industries, they, they change too. So, um, you know, so even if you feel like you're, you want to do something a little different, you know, at, at Young and Partners, you can go from life sciences to chemicals. If you're in a big firm like a Barclays, you can always go from a coverage group to a capital markets group and vice versa. Right. So the banks definitely are organizations that, um, you know, once you're in a company, it's much easier to get a new job than if you're on the outside doing campus recruiting. And if they like you and, and you right. and you and you have good skills, they 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 will try to help you right. uh, with any changes. Uh, there's a question here from Al, uh, Olivier. It says, "What advice would you give to newcomers with little experience, non-traditional backgrounds, whatever that is, and how are investment banks interested by candidate in?" by candidates or actually in candidates with graduate studies such as masters or PhDs in scientific fields. Anyone? I, th I think, um, listen, by, by definition, most of the folks coming out of a place like Yale, any of the liberal art colleges, do not have the requisite technical experience to go into the investment banking field, which to me is a positive because your training is in liberal arts, you may be a history major, and I think that sort of covers the, you know, being, getting a PhD, and I'll come to that in a moment, but you've got non-traditional experience. You're a political science major, you're a history major, and for me, because I'm involved in a lot of the recruiting that we do at, at my firm at UBS, that is terrific. I'd, I'd love to find some people who have, uh, are uh, intellectually, um, intellectually challenged by getting into the profession. They typically know nothing about it. They may have some facility with numbers in terms of being a math major or an econ major, but by and large, there's very little understanding from a technical standpoint of the investment bank. And I find that very positive. So, and to the extent that you have additional experience, whether it's a master's degree or PhD in a scientific field, I think that too is very exciting. And I think uh, similarly people coming out of five years of being in the military, I find that very interesting because you've had experience in leadership, leading people, playing on teams. Um, so all of this sort of, shall we say, categorized as non-traditional experience, I think it's extraordinarily relevant in investment banking. And, and I think people who are coming out of that kind of experience uh, relative to somebody coming out of a UVA, UVA, Wharton, et cetera, with a bachelor's degree in finance to me is, is uh, 
is more exciting than some, somebody who's done a lot of numbers? I'd answer in the following way. First of all, in general, I think uh, uh, the specific degree that you have from Yale, or whether it's an undergraduate or a master's or PhD, is less of a critical factor of success uh, than your personality and your general skills. However, with the following caveat, for those firms that are specialist firms, like uh, our firm focuses on serving clients around the world in chemicals and life science, it is true that if you have a chemical engineering degree or you have a biotech degree or whatever, it's definitely helpful, right? If you have that, does it mean in the long term you're more successful? Hard to say, but definitely you could get up to speed faster if you're trying to uh, see if you're working with client, if you have a biotech background and or biochemistry, it'll help you understand uh, this industry better. I will say one thing though, it is I strongly advise everyone uh, to make sure you take an accounting course before you, uh, before you go into best banking. Yale has notoriously not had the world's yeah. most, uh, shall we say, elegant accounting courses, but uh, do that, do yourself a favor, uh, take a summer and take accounting and so forth, because that's one of those things that is just a rules-based thing. And if you know it before you start investment bank, it just helps you. But that doesn't mean you have to have a certain a major in accounting, but it's just very helpful to know. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of people who have advanced degrees, um, you know, in things like pure sciences, or, you know, I think one thing is just, what level are you going to be coming into at an organization? Um, you know, some companies, they put much more emphasis on work experience rather than educational credentials. And then it's up to you to decide, well, is this something that, is this opportunity that this firm is willing to offer me something that, that I find attractive? So that's one thing. Um, and then I think Ultimately, it also depends on what area of the firm you're in. I mean, I would say for someone uh, who has a specialized degree, things like equity research or credit research might be a great way to just continue diving and building upon that expertise that you do have. And, you know, and frankly, I would think the interest that you have in a particular space um, but in the the areas of banking that the three of us work in, ultimately, as you get more senior, it's not just about being able to build numbers and, and crunch crunch numbers. It's about building relationships and connections with people because in the end, what we do is is very much on the client facing side of um, of of investment banking. I mean, there are other areas of banking like sales and trading where um, you know where you don't necessarily, you know, no one studies a degree that makes them a good trader. But, you know, if, if you are, are interested in things like that, it doesn't really matter what your background is as long as, you know, you're a nimble thinker and you're, you're you know, facile with numbers and, and enjoy the job. Yeah. There's a last question here and it says, hi, Philip again. Thank you, Philip, for another question. I'm actually interested in quantitative analyst roles since I'm trained to build physical models for my current PhD uh, training. I'll start off just say, look, a, the, a large um, part of investment banking involves models, mm -hmm. spreadsheets, and so forth, whether it's on the uh, uh, M&A side or the corporate finance side, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, in, in wealth manager, right? Mm -hmm. You have to deal with that. So I would say uh, there may be a few areas uh, in investment banking where quantitative skills and so forth and model building are not important, but it's a minority, a vast majority. So if you're good at building models and doing analytical work, I would say uh, 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 that's a very helpful skill to have if you want to go investment banking. Yeah, and then on the trading side, so something that the bulge brackets would have, there are a lot of research roles and, and roles that are very quantitative in nature and um, that seek out candidates with advanced quantitative degrees. Yeah. Um, I'll make one more commercial for another element that we've just talked about within investment banking, that's wealth management. Um, that part of the business continues to grow rather rapidly. It will continue to grow. Okay, um, sorry, I've just been told to move over so that I don't appear to be a <laughs> phantom on the screen. 
Um, so uh, for those of you who are interested in that part of the business, it's not as well advertised on campus. It is by definition a much easier lifestyle. There is uh, the opportunities continue to be fast in the wealth management field. Uh, the lifestyle is certainly, regardless of the culture of the organization, the, the lifestyle is much easier on average uh, relative to investment banking. I know Peter's firm is, is the gentler, kinder, kinder uh, form of investment banking. No calls after six o'clock, right? Um, but um, that is certainly something that all of you should, should consider as you look at uh, issues relating to lifestyle and what you want out of uh, your career. But to be the contrarian, I will also say that there are some structural things happening in, in fund management and, and wealth yeah. management that are negative. And this is public knowledge. Uh, the, the fees are under attack, right? Yes. This is public knowledge. If you Google any, anything, yeah. you'll yeah. And the other is, there's the, there's this concern whether AI artificial intelligence is going to uh, make it tougher for people who are in the uh, you know in the asset management side. Yeah. So no matter but no matter what part of investment bank you talk about, there are pluses and minuses. So there's not a single one where everything is 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 a plus. So I'm not saying it's not. It's just every single one has a variety mm -hmm. of pluses and minuses. But with that, I want to say we are now. Uh, uh, five minutes past the, uh, the, the the ending time. I want to thank uh, my two co-panelists mm -hmm. uh, for, for their us. participation. I hope this has been helpful to you in the audience in terms of helping you uh, with your career decision making. I want to say uh, we have two events uh, that are coming up the later this fall. One is going to be a Yale career panel. Uh, on consulting, which I know is of great interest to many uh, of the students and alumni. We also uh, have a separate series, which is Yale Career Issues and Fireside Chats, where we've done serving on boards, managing major career changes, so forth. And we're going to have a really kind of a fun session uh, later this fall on the, uh, the use of social media. You know, how do you uh, get benefits out of it, but how do you make sure it doesn't hurt you? So, and we're going to try a different format where we have a panel and then we're going to have a cocktail hour and uh, let people get to know each other and, uh, and share some beers. So uh, we'll be sending out notices for both of those uh, shortly and we hope you'll join us for those. Uh, th this particular panel, as, as is true for all panels, uh, is, is recorded and you can watch the recordings of the last 25 uh, Yale Career Panels at YaleCareerPanels.com. And, uh, uh, and uh, if you missed, happened to miss one on architecture or whatever, uh, you'll find them there on that website. So thank you again thank to you. the panelists, thank you. Thank you. and thank you. we hope this has been helpful to all of you.